Are you in college? The Thomistic Institute Study Abroad program is now accepting applications for the spring semester of 2024. This unique and exciting study abroad program offers you the opportunity to spend a semester in Rome at the Dominican Order's Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas. You'll study the ancient and medieval intellectual tradition of Rome, live with like-minded young men and women steps from the Colosseum, and participate in weekly cultural and intellectual events, regular day trips, and multi-day excursions. To learn more about this life-changing opportunity, go to ThomisticInstitute.org slash Rome. That's ThomisticInstitute.org slash Rome. Welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast. Our mission is to promote the Catholic intellectual tradition in the university, the church, and the wider public square. The lectures on this podcast are organized by university students at Thomistic Institute chapters around the world. To learn more and to attend these events, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. So we finished um, in our last session uh, the um, text in question one. And question one is directing us towards, or is focusing on the question of the last end. So maybe it would be good to sort of pause for a moment before jumping into questions two and three in the Prima Secundae, and just remember again, what is Aquinas doing here, and what are we trying to learn from him as we study this? So in the prologue to the Prima Secundae, Aquinas is saying he starts with the image of God, And he says, we've treated God, now let's look at the image of God, that is, the human being who has powers of intellect and will, that is, is able to know and love and thus direct his actions towards an end. And then, in question one, the prologue to question one is saying, we now need to consider the last end and then the means by which we get to the end. And we've seen Aquinas say repeatedly, the end is really important in human action because even though it's the last thing you get to, it's the first thing that you intend when you start acting. So we should think about where our life is going in order to live life well. If you never think about where your life is going, the implication would be, then you're going to live your life in kind of a chaotic way. It's going to be here and there and lack a certain unity. So the end is exercising a kind of attractive power over all of the actions that are done for the sake of the end. I think that that's reasonably clear. And then in question one, Aquinas is going through these questions about the last end. Does it belong to man to act for an end? His answer is yes, because we're rational. He says, in fact, every being acts for an end, but the human creature acts for an end in a distinctive way because we understand what we're doing and we intentionally choose it. We're not just directed to it by something above us and we we have no knowledge of it. We're not just blindly moved. We move ourselves. Okay, so that's typical of human action and that's that's our subject. But then he he wants to ask, okay, are our actions specified by the end? And he says, yes, the end is exercising its power on all the things that you do leading to it. Is there a last end? Is it one? Or can you have several? Can you choose more or less yourself what it's going to be? Is it the same for all? And Aquinas' answer in going through those questions is to say, well, there can't be many last ends if you really understand what an end is and what a last end is. A last end being something perfect that will fulfill all of your desires. So there can only be one of those. And while you can make choices, in the end, you will always act as, and we're going to see him take up this theme again, you're always going to act for the sake of the good and an ultimate perfection or happiness. So he's actually making a kind of strong claim that there isn't 
really any possibility for a rational creature to have an end other than happiness. That doesn't mean that we all know what happiness is, or that we're all going to agree in what it consists. But he thinks it's kind of a structural thing for a rational creature that you're directing yourself towards something that you at least think is good. And then in the end, there has to be something like uniting all of that, where you're somehow aiming at whatever would satisfy all of your desires, if there is such a thing. Yeah, question. Really, I want to ask about the end. Does Aquinas have an answer? Yeah, the, so the, the, there, that's an excellent question. So the question is, well, okay, you've got some people who are trying to work in more or less a Thomistic framework, although they're obviously bringing in some more modern presuppositions uh, known as the new natural law theory has come to be known uh, as that. Um, one of the great early critics of the new natural law theory is someone named Dr. Russell Hittinger, who wrote a book um, on this back in the 90s, early 2000s. In the 80s? Okay. So this debate has been going on for a while. Um, but the question is about venial sin. Okay, so um, some people will say things. Now, you, you also hear this. Sorry, if I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent here, but I'm going to try to be concise. Some people um, in kind of pious Catholic circles will say something like this. Maybe I should actually clarify. Does everybody know what we're talking about when we say venial versus mortal sin? So in the Catholic tradition, a mortal sin is a sin that is fatal to the spiritual life. It is the death of the supernatural principle, the principle of supernatural life. It disorders you from God. And if you die in a state of mortal sin without any repentance, then you're not going to go to heaven. You're going to go to hell. That's the, that's the classic teaching. So you'd, you'd be condemned because of, that, because of that sin. But there are other sins that are not as serious, which are called venial sins. And venial just comes from the word which means um, to be forgiven. So venial sins are, are light sins that don't disrupt charity, that is, your love of God above all things. And so they are compatible with continuing to be in a state of grace. Okay, so this poses a, a puzzle because it's like, well, it seems like if I know that something is a sin, and it just so happens that it's only a venial sin, and I choose it, that I am disordering myself from God. So shouldn't it be a mortal sin? Or shouldn't all sins in that sense, if they're really you know, knowingly and voluntarily chosen, be mortal? And the Catholic tradition has refused to take that position, and in fact has condemned that position. That has been a position taken in various, at various points in in history, um, and the church has formally condemned it. Uh, so what's going on there? Then what are you doing if you're, if you're making the choice to sin venially, you know, and knowingly? So some people will say things like, well, it might be a venial sin for other people, but for me, because I'm such a spiritual person, it is a venial. It's, you know, that venial sin would be mortal because I like really know what I'm doing here. Um, but the, the church doesn't accept that analysis, actually. Uh, why? And it has to do with ends. Um, so charity, this is maybe getting ahead of, of where we want to be, but charity is what orders your will ultimately to, the, to God as the last end, the supernatural last end. So loving him above all things. A venial sin, in a certain way by definition, is an act that is not incompatible with loving God above all things. That doesn't mean that you can't choose other things that are not themselves moving you towards God. But they're also not um, disrupting the love of God above all things. So venial sins, I mean, it's, it's possible, for example, to be on a journey and to keep moving on that journey, well, you do lots of little things that are not actually directed towards that journey. 
you can be driving on your way to work and thinking about, um, you know, what you're going to do for your summer vacation. Um, so that what you're going to do for your summer vacation might not be according to God's will, but you're not disrupting the, the direction of your journey by, by doing that. I think, I feel like maybe I've given sort of a confusing answer that's gotten us ahead of where we, where we need to be. So I'm not going to take, I'm not going to pursue this line anymore because we haven't even gotten into the material for today. So let's, um, and this, let me hope that I'll do a better job after we've presented more material and then we'll have more to, more to say about this. Okay, so what I want to do is, is see, like Aquinas is talking about the last end as structuring um, all of the other choices that we make, and it can only be one. Okay, um, so let's, and maybe I'll just add one um, final thought about this, following on what we discussed at the quad liberal session about per se series and per accident series. I think maybe it would be helpful to think about it um, this way. What's at stake in that kind of question? I think what's ultimately at stake is, is there only one last end, or can you have multiples? That's really where this enters into the discussion. Okay, so think of it this way. The end, the last end, is a cause of you choosing all the intermediate ends. It's the most powerful good that's making all these intermediate ends be good for you. So if you just were to think about, I don't know, the project of launching yourself on your career, and you say, well, I need to get my, my uh, undergraduate degree in order to do that. In order to get my undergraduate degree, I need to pass my classes. And in order to pass my classes, I need to do my homework. And in order to do my homework, I need to get up on time this morning. You know? so you've got a series of nested ends. And in a way, you can say, why are you doing your homework? Or why are you getting up this morning? And the most powerful reason for that is, has to do with like, well, I want to finish my degree. I want to get launched on my career. And then we could say, well, what are you doing that for? And we're going to eventually end up with, I'm seeking happiness. That's sort of the, the claim. So the end is a cause, and it's the most powerful cause in the order of action. It's what sets action off. So in a per se series, the ultimate end, the last end, is exercising its power in all of those intermediate choices. Now, maybe you're not always thinking it all the way through, but it is operating at least in the background to shape what you're doing. And Aquinas's claim is the final cause is your ultimate perfection, what will quell all of your desires, which is what we call happiness. And structurally speaking, he thinks that that's always going to be the case for every rational creature, even someone who doesn't want it to be the case is still, in, the way, in a way, going to have to choose for the sake of something perceived to be good. And, okay, so what's his example? Victory is a ultimate cause. It's not or an, an ultimate end. It's maybe not the most ultimate, but he's just saying, okay, let's, let's zoom in on one test case. Victory is the end. Fighting well is the intermediate end. So how do we understand that? Can you win, can you be victorious without fighting well? Well, you could just get lucky, right? But in the order of action, in the order of intention, you can't say, well, I'm, I'm going to intend victory by getting lucky. That's actually not a good plan to aim at victory, right? If you're going to engage in intentional action towards victory, what do you have to do? You have to figure out how to fight well. And I think that's what he's trying to say is there's, an, there's a per se ordering between those ends where the ultimate end is shaping the in, your choice of the intermediate end in some way, in some way that actually structures or defines what that intermediate end is. In a per accident series, the example being stealing for the sake of giving alms, 
It's true that giving alms might motivate you to steal, but it isn't really shaping the act of theft in the sense of giving the act of theft its its intentional shape. So you can connect stealing to almsgiving, but it's not like fighting well is connected to victory. Okay, why is it important? I think what Aquinas is trying to say uh, or trying to get at is that a last end, which is one, provides a kind of unity to the actions of life, which allow you to intend that last end and, and build a kind of coherent plan that isn't just arbitrary that you put these things together, but these actions are actually moving you up the chain of perfections towards an ultimate perfection. So if you were to say that the last end is multiple, I think Aquinas would respond, well, either one, you've misunderstood what happiness really is, that it's structuring all of our actions, that it's the ultimate thing that we structurally have to act for. And if you were to hold that there's multiple final ends, your life is going to be irretrievably fragmented. Uh, So you won't be able to unify it again. And it seems to me, like, that seems to me to be true. If you aren't clear on having a final end that you're trying to order your life towards, then your life is going to be fragmented. And it seems to me that perhaps this is part of the drama of Augustine's life in the Confessions. This, I think, is related to the purpose of questions one to five at the beginning of the Prima Secundae. And there's an interesting article about this that came out in the Thomist a few years ago by Adam Eitel, who's another Mystic Institute speaker. And he said, you know, questions one to five are are actually kind of hard to understand if you um, just read them as uh, like all the other questions in the Prima Secundae, because in a certain way, they're they're covering the whole material of the Prima Secundae in the first five questions, and then uh, Aquinas is going to like break it down through the, the rest of the Prima Secundae, which is very long. And so that seems to be contrary to Aquinas' own uh, method, where he's avoiding repetition. Uh, and, you know, some things are so compressed in the first five questions that we're going to need a lot more distinctions to be drawn later. And Adam's argument is, Well, actually, I think the first five questions are a kind of rhetorical piece to get the reader thinking about the last end as God and our activity of enjoying the last end as the contemplative life. And in a way, then he's going to be unpacking that, but he wants to like focus you on that in the first five questions. So some of it is very compressed. Question two. So now Aquinas is asking about what does happiness consist in? In Latin, the beginning of question two, the preface asks, in quibus sit, uh, which could also be said like, um, what is it found in or where is it found? And Aquinas begins here by, so if we were to look through the, the list of eight, articles in this question. He begins with exterior things, things exterior to the person, wealth, honor, fame, or glory, and power. And then he discusses bodily goods. That's something that does belong to the person, but it's not the highest part of the person. And then he discusses in Article 7 and 8, goods of the soul. So we're, we're ascending here. And as, as you know, you know, he's going to think that we do need to ascend from exterior things and transcend bodily goods and get to something that is a spiritual good or the good of the soul. Okay, so can we we go through his analysis of these various contenders for in what happiness consists? And, you know, people, various people, and maybe lots of people that we know have put forward these ideas or at least implicitly are pursuing them. 
So it's actually, I find, very helpful to like think them through a little bit and try and understand why they are or are not good candidates for that where we're going to find our happiness. So the first one is wealth. Article 1 uh, addresses this. And Aquinas just says it's impossible for man's happiness to consist in wealth. And there he makes a distinction between artificial wealth and natural wealth. Natural wealth are things that actually serve your natural needs. He gives examples such as food, drink, clothing, cars. I mean, I think vehicula is the Latin there. I don't think he thinks it's an, a self-moving car, an automobile. Um, but it's a car that is, has some motor, like an animal. Um, dwellings, and such like. While artificial wealth is that which is not a direct help to nature as money, but is invented by the art of man for the convenience of exchange and as a measure of things saleable. Okay. So two kinds of wealth. And actually, if you think about it, as he goes on to explain, artificial wealth is sought for the sake of natural wealth. So you only want money if you can spend it. So dollars are valuable because you can spend them. If we woke up tomorrow and you could not spend any dollars, like we've switched to a new currency, the pile of you know, green bills that you're hiding under your mattress at home would be not useful to you, except you know, for something unrelated to being currency. So you only want artificial wealth for the sake of natural wealth, or so it would seem. Now, there's maybe an exception to this that Aquinas does uh, add here, a disorder that can creep into our desire for artificial wealth. But in itself, artificial wealth is only good for the natural goods that you can get. But the natural goods, can, you can only enjoy so many of them. So there's a point at which you can't use any more of them. So uh, didn't Johnny Depp buy some Caribbean islands or something like that? Does this sound familiar to you? Um, I think he did. Um, well, if you're like a really rich movie star and you buy a Caribbean island, well, that sounds pretty good. Um, gosh. Could the Thomistic Institute use a Caribbean island? Maybe. We could be having this conference there. But if you had 25 Caribbean islands, it, you know, the 26th doesn't serve much purpose for you. You don't even have enough time to get to that island to enjoy it. And certainly if you were to have many hundreds of Caribbean islands, there's just no way that you really need that much. You can't get to it all. And that's even you know, more clear if we think about food. Like there's only so much food that you can possibly eat in a day or in a lifetime. And so more doesn't help you actually at that point. You can't endlessly pile up natural goods and keep wanting more of them. Curiously though, it does seem that you can endlessly pile up artificial wealth. And that's the kind of curiosity that Aquinas draws our attention to in this article. So it does seem that artificial wealth holds a kind of lure or you know, hold on the mind so that disordered desire can try to keep getting it without measure. But that's not, an, that's not a good plan for happiness. And then we might also ask, Aquinas, I think, doesn't really um, treat this, but we might ask, do we know people who are really wealthy, or have we at least heard about them, um, who are pretty significantly unhappy? And it seems to me that the answer to that is yes. There's lots of people who are pretty wealthy who are also pretty unhappy. Now, you might say, well, I don't know, you know. Johnny Depp seems like he's doing pretty well with his 
Caribbean island and his yacht. But I don't know if you've watched, you know, the news about him, but it doesn't seem like the, you know, it seems like kind of a wretched um, life that he's, now maybe there's other problems than just love of money, but, um, okay. Honor and fame, article two. Aquinas starts off, once again, it's impossible for happiness to consist in honor, for honor is given to a man on account of some excellence in him, and consequently, it's a sign and attestation of the excellence that is in the person honored. So, honor or fame consists of a kind of praise, attestation, a sign of excellence. But, Aquinas' point here, honor can result from being good, but it isn't the cause of being good. One is praised for being good. One is not good because you are praised. And you can do this little thought experiment. Suppose um, you were a, I don't know, a soldier in World War II, let's just say, you know, um, because that's, that's a thing we see a lot in the movies. So a soldier in a unit in World War II, and you actually were really cowardly. You were very afraid. The battle's going on, and you're just curled up in the bottom of your foxhole and unable to move. But your buddy, who's next to you in the foxhole, is extremely courageous. And he jumps up and does some tremendous act of valor and causes the battle to be won, but he's killed in the process. And through some mistake, they conclude that you were the one who did that act of valor. And they give you the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest award that you can get. Now, in, if you get the Congressional Medal of Honor, the president awards it to you himself, and then you are authorized to wear it for the rest of your life. And in the military, like this is given out so rarely in the U.S. military that uh, wherever you go, they roll out the red carpet for you. The military is constantly honoring you as one of the greatest heroes that the country has ever known. Okay, so you become a kind of a famous person. What would that be like psychologically if you knew that your friend had died to do this act of honor and you had been the coward? Having that medal, I would suggest, would become a source of torture, not a source of happiness. And I think that sort of illustrates the point that you only really want to be honored for an excellence that you actually have. And if you're honored for an excellence that you know you don't have, it's probably not going to lead to your happiness. Or at least you'll have to be a rather superficial person to take much satisfaction in that. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Power. I'm, I'm kind of lumping honor. Uh, I think we've, we've consisted, uh, we've, we've covered fame or glory sufficiently, so let's go to Article 4 about power. To summarize Aquinas' analysis here, I think we can do it fairly simply. Power means you're able to do something. It's the potency to do something. But potency to do something is just a means to doing something. So then you have to ask, well, what are you going to use your power for? With great power comes great responsibility, I heard someone say once. <laughs> So you need to decide what to use it for, or how to use it. And in fact, we know that it can be used for evil. And there have been some, you know, lots of famous cases of that. So simply having power is not enough to make you good. And likewise, like wealth, the powerful are often unhappy. I think you can, you can also verify that from history. Um, Adolf Hitler did not end a happy man. Uh, maybe that's, you know, not the right example we want to go to. We could probably go to lots of other 
tyrants and despots who had a lot of power and didn't end uh, as happy. So power doesn't seem to be enough. Something more would need to be there. It's not to say that power is bad. I mean, note that in all of these things, Aquinas is not saying that these are bad things. He's just saying that the ultimate happiness cannot consist in them. Okay, what about pleasure? Article 5 and Article 6. Can our ultimate happiness consist in any bodily good? When Aquinas treats in Article 5 about bodily goods, he's going to say, well, the goods of the body should be ordained to the goods of the soul. The goods of the soul are higher. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to spend any more time on that um, than that point, because I'd like to talk specifically about pleasure in Article 6, because pleasure is actually a really interesting and important case. And I'd like to dwell on this for a little bit. So we've been going through these, these various goods. We've gone through the exterior goods now. And now we're talking about goods that pertain to the body. Although, as we see, pleasure is now maybe moving us into the spiritual realm because Aquinas acknowledges that there can be pleasures which are not just bodily. So I think we could say, if you're, if you're a Thomist, that pleasure hits a little closer to the mark about happiness than anything we've talked about so far. And that's very surprising to some people. They think, oh, okay, we're supposed to be um, like moral Catholics and we should be suspicious of pleasure. But actually Aquinas is not suspicious of all pleasure. He thinks that it needs to be rightly ordered, okay? But getting a right, and, and Aristotle, I think, uh, teaches us something very important here. Getting a right understanding of pleasure is very important for the moral life because how you experience pleasure and the things in which you take pleasure has a lot to do with virtue and how good you are. So we could even say pleasure is a measure of your virtue and the moral goodness of your life. We can look at the things you take pleasure in and make some assessment of your moral maturity, you might say. And that's interesting. Aristotle thinks that being rightly trained to take pleasure in the right things and not in the wrong things is the essence of the moral life. So actually, this is really important. Why? Because pleasure is obviously connected with desire. Desire should be for the good. So understanding how pleasure is related to the good or the desire for the good turns out to be really important. So pleasure is not like those exterior things that we can just say, oh yeah, those are, those are not even close calls. In fact, it turns out that seeking pleasure in the right way or the right kind of delectatio, if we want to use Aquinas' term, which maybe is a little easier because that is easier to orient towards something spiritual. Seeking the right kind of delectatio turns out to be actually important for happiness. Okay, can we clear the ground with some erroneous views of pleasure? Let me just very quickly summarize them. Very common in our time is the utilitarian view of pleasure. Think maybe John Stuart Mill. On a utilitarian view, and I'm just giving you a caricature, we could discuss this at much greater length and probably uh, the other instructors here would be more, um, would be better equipped to do this. But on the utilitarian view, all pleasures are essentially the same or can at least be reduced to some common denominator. Pleasure units, you know, in some way. Actually, economists do this, uh, like methodologically. And so if you, if you oversell or overcommit to that kind of view, now I think economics maybe can be, you know, if you, if you add the right distinctions, maybe you can make it work. But if you try to make everything into economics, 
you're effectively, and using that kind of pleasure units or utils, as an economist might say, um, if you do that and you think you can explain human be all human behavior from that or reduce all human behavior to that, uh, there's a philosophical argument that, you know, Aristotelians and Thomists will want to have with you. Um, are all pleasures essentially the same? Well, as I'm about to argue, no. Okay, but let's just hold that off for a second. Another false view that's very common today, the hedonist view, or you might say like the, the it's a kind of reductionist view, pleasure is all there is. And specifically bodily pleasure is all there is. So you should always seek to maximize your own pleasure and minimize your pain. Uh, Aquinas calls this view the, the view of the Epicureans. Generally, this is coupled with a materialistic view of the world and wants to say, yeah, you know, there's really only bodies out there. We are just bodies. Other things are bodies. The only real kinds of pleasure are sensory. So pleasure is then reduced to sensation. And, I mean, I think Aquinas would also think that's a, a philosophically inadequate account of reality. The Stoics held the view that all pleasures are evil. So this is maybe yet another category of false views about pleasure. Uh, Stoicism, I think, is making a real comeback. And you find lots of people, like, on YouTube giving you advice about how to be a Stoic. Um, I don't think that's good advice. Some of it might be helpful to detach you from the excesses of our time, which tends to be rather hedonistic or utilitarian. So in that sense, maybe Stoicism starts detaching you some of the, from some of those false views, but I think it's also proposing a false view. So uh, it is overcorrecting in a certain way. We also encounter, related to the Stoic view, that all pleasures are evil and we should seek a kind of, Stoicism wants to see a kind of passivity or um, impassivity rather, uh, that I can't be affected by those things. We could encounter, for example, the Kantian view, the view of Immanuel Kant. Pleasures are maybe unhelpful in the moral realm. They make your action less moral if you enjoy it. It's probably not a moral action or it's less moral. You want to just do it out of your duty. You know, and the more pure your duty is, the less pleasure is going to be there for you. Like the most pure duty or virtuous act of fulfilling your duty would be one where you get no pleasure in it at all, um, but you're just doing it because it's your duty. Um, Aquinas actually thinks that good acts should give you pleasure. So this would be a disagreement, I think, between Kant and Aquinas. We also might encounter the Calvinist view. This is, I think, especially prevalent in the U.S., given our heritage. And in the colonial period for the United States, like in the 18th century, there were Calvinist laws in quite a number of places, think New England, that enforced simplicity. So there were laws against ornamented clothing. You had to have very simple buttons, things like that. I mean, imagine the city regulating that. It was a kind of Calvinist command suspicious of anything too exuberant. Uh, so, no drinking, no gambling, no dancing. That's all pretty suspicious activity. So we do actually live in a culture that continues to be shaped by that dynamic. Prohibition was a Protestant movement that equated virtue with no alcohol. And even today, when we are engaged in kind of public debate over the relationship between, say, morality and law, or how law should be moral, most people in the U.S. immediately are worried about or are thinking in the template of this Calvinist view, which basically thinks that pleasure is bad 
And so the law is, needs to like clamp down on all the things that you really want to do. Above all, sexual things. Um, okay, so you see how maybe that has given us a kind of pathology that we have to work through for American culture anyway, to understand the right relationship between pleasure and the good. Okay, so what's, what is the right way to think about pleasure and the good? In question two, article six, what we're looking at, Aquinas says that delight or delectatio is a proper accident of happiness. A proper accident. What does that mean? It means that it's not the very essence of happiness, but it's something that flows from happiness and belongs to it as a kind of property. So it's not the definition of happiness, but where you find true happiness, you will find that delectatio. So let's look at what he says here. This is about, um, I think it's the third full sentence in Aquinas' answer. We must therefore consider that every delight is a proper accident resulting from happiness or from some part of happiness, since the reason that a man is delighted is that he has some fitting good, either in reality or in hope, or at least in memory. Now, a fitting good, if indeed it be the perfect good, is precisely man's happiness, and if it is imperfect, it is a share of happiness, either proximate or remote, or at least apparent. Therefore, it's evident that neither is delight, which results from the perfect good, the very essence of happiness, but something resulting therefrom as a proper accident. So what, what is he saying here about what is pleasure? It's not the thing that makes you happy. It's the result of having the thing, or maybe better, doing the thing that makes you happy. It's the flowering of the possession of the good, or the good activity. Another way to think about it is that you don't aim directly at the pleasure, if you really want the pleasure, you should aim at the good, and then you will obtain the pleasure. And that's actually a very helpful thing to begin to grasp. A good activity done well will give some kind of delectatio. Now that delectatio is not necessarily bodily, and Aquinas is going to analyze here that Bodily pleasure is not really the highest form of pleasure, but a spiritual delectatio is more powerful. So let's think about what kind of pleasure, or what, what is delectatio in this sense, and I think we could say it's analogical, just like goodness is analogical. So there's the pleasure of eating a chocolate bar, the pleasure of a hot bath, the pleasure of a good meal eaten with friends, are these the, the pleasure of sitting in the sun on a summer day? Are these the same thing? Well, they're all bodily pleasures, so in some sense maybe they have that in common. But they're really rather different kinds of things. And then there are things like the pleasure of doing a sport well, the pleasure of winning a race, the pleasure of reading a good book or watching a good movie, or even the pleasure of studying something and understanding it. So do you remember the experience? Maybe you've had this, I certainly had this experience in like middle school or freshman year of high school. You're working on a math problem and you finally get it, you've worked really hard to figure it out, and all of a sudden you understand it, there's a kind of pleasure that comes from that. It's not like eating a chocolate bar or taking a hot bath. It's a higher kind of pleasure, and maybe it can be a more satisfying kind of pleasure in some sense. So there are even higher pleasures than this. That would be a kind of a natural spiritual pleasure. 
We could think about other pleasures like teaching someone and seeing them get it. That's different from getting it yourself. The pleasure of giving a gift to someone that they really like. That's actually a pretty great pleasure. The pleasure of helping someone who really needs your help. And then we could talk about the pleasures proper to the supernatural life. Knowing God. Loving God. Giving your life to God. Praising Him. Being united to Him when you receive the Eucharist. These are not pleasures that you, like, understand at the beginning, perhaps, of your spiritual life. But they're very real pleasures. And as you enter more deeply into a spiritual life, they become more and more powerful on you. Sometimes we need to discover new pleasures. And that can even be unpleasant. Doing the hard work of working through the math problem generates then the pleasure of understanding the result. Um, my brother, my younger brother, was afraid of swimming and eventually just had to be thrown in by my mother. And then he discovered that he loved it. So, you know, he's on the dock saying, no, 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 oh, I don't want to go in, I don't want to go in. And then he got in the water and he loved it. Okay, so... There can be lots of things like that for us where we don't really know what is awaiting us. And we have to like actually strip away some of the lower pleasures in order to attain the higher pleasures. And I think that's maybe what St. Augustine is also talking about. <clears throat> so pleasure in the end for Aquinas is tied to the activity you're doing and to the good you're possessing. So pleasure is like doing that well, and understanding that gets us a long way towards um, directing our lives rightly. Let me just say there's a big complicating factor here, and that's the problem of the fall. But Aquinas doesn't really treat that here, so I'm not going to delay us on that, but we can talk about that more. Um, due to the wounds of original sin, we have lots of disordered desires. And we find it hard to take pleasure in the higher things and easy to get stuck on the lower things. And in a way, that's also the drama of the confessions. Augustine recognizing after a certain time that he should be loving God above all things and that that would be the best thing for him to do. And yet he's unable to do it. And that realization produces a particular pain in the soul. One is divided. Because you're not yet free to wholly devote yourself to the higher good, which will give you the higher pleasure. And you experience that as painful. And in a certain way, your attachment to the lower pleasures becomes unwanted. And yet, you don't feel free to let them go. And that's weird. Why does that happen to us? Augustine has that passage, which perhaps you've already uh, discussed or meditated on where he's talking about the will, and he says, all I needed to do was will to do the good, will to give up the sin. And I would have given up the sin because it's just an act of willing that I needed to do. But that was the one thing that I couldn't do. That's a sign that something has gone wrong with us, and our wills, when stuck in sin, are not totally free. God's grace comes and removes our attachment to the lower thing, turns us towards the higher thing, and then we experience it as a liberation, because now finally we're ordering our loves in the right way. But that's the problem of the fall and the need for grace. Uh, let's just round out our discussion of question two. Is happiness some good of the soul? Aquinas thinks that uh, we need a distinction here. And this is an important distinction. I think just in the interest of time, I'll just conclude with this. There is on the one hand, the thing itself which we desire to attain. That's like exterior to us. And especially when we're talking about the, the last end, which is God, God's obviously different from us. So in one sense, happiness, or our final end, 
is not in us or is different from our activity. But on the other hand, he says, the attainment or possession of that thing, the use of that thing, that is an activity of our soul. And so that is our happiness. We'll get a clear statement of this distinction in question three, article one, where it comes up yet again. Our happiness itself, Aquinas says, consists in the perfect good that fulfills all desire. That needs to be an infinite good. Our soul is finite. So it can't just be in our soul in the way that it is in itself. And yet we do really want to say that we possess and enjoy that perfect good by an activity of soul. So in one sense, the perfect good is outside of us or is not simply the soul. But in another sense, the use or the enjoyment, the union with that perfect good does belong to the soul. And that's the activity that Aquinas thinks is the, the highest activity that we're really meant for. Okay, I think we've covered uh, the important stuff in question two. I would have liked to get into question three, but we'll save that ambition for the next session. So why don't I ask if there's questions, uh, because I think we have a little time. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, regarding the, the article about pleasure, if pleasure is in a certain way compatible with suffering and pain, I'm thinking mainly of uh, Christ's passion and crucifixion, so, can one delight spiritually, even if there's uh, whether physical or, or spiritual pain um, when trying to strive for the good? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think Jesus is, in a way, doing what he wants to be doing on the cross. He's not willing the suffering as suffering, but he's accepting the suffering as a kind of concomitant to fixing the problem of human sin. Just as God doesn't will human sin, you know, but he, he accepts its consequences, Jesus does, for our sake. Um, and in the same way, the athlete accepts the unpleasantness of the training for the sake of the victory, um, and so in a certain sense wills that suffering, uh, but doesn't will it for its own sake, wills it only as a kind of concomitant uh, of of doing the good activity. So I think that's... But how about delighting in that pain? Or not just willing it, accept it, but delighting. I don't think you delight... I mean, delight is in a good. Yeah. Uh, the pain is in itself, per se, not a good. Um, per accidents, it's a good because it's adjoined to getting to the goal. So I think you wouldn't delight in the pain per se, but only, you know, per accidents, insofar as it's a sign, you know, like you could say, oh, that was a really good run because, uh, like, I was really breathing hard um, at the end, or I was really exhausted. Um, but by that, you just mean, like, you're, you're characterizing the run, you're not characterizing the pain, it seems to me. Yeah. Yes. Could you elaborate a little how does Catholicity in the moral <clears throat> imagination or moral legislation? So the Calvinist pathology, I think, is to... So Calvin is concerned that um, too, much, too much delight uh, is um, not spiritual enough. I mean, Calvinism is also iconoclastic. So by, by which I mean, like, the Calvinists covered over all of the images in the cathedrals, you know, destroyed the images. They want, you know, a, Calvin, a classic Calvinist church is very austere. And why is it austere? It's austere for the sake of, like, the spiritual purity of the worship, which shouldn't get caught up in things that are too sensory. Uh, so it's a, it, I think... There is a kind of um, creeping, well, I don't know if I want to say a, a creeping, you know, Gnostic tendency, but there, there's a kind of creeping suspicion of bodily things, 
with uh, Calvin or bodily pleasures so that we need the kind of um, strict uh, spiritual purity. And that, you know, there's a lot of concern for um, not having too much, not having too much fun, you know. And that, that goes back, you know, Calvin was doing that in Geneva. I, I may not be really amplifying that. I mean, maybe, maybe we, like, if we really wanted to go into that, maybe we'd read some Calvin and see what he's, what he's concerned with there. Yeah. With like Catholics and like sex, birth control, like pleasure, recreation, like procreation, recreation, like would, would the Catholic Church not also have the teaching, like a teach, like a teaching similar of austerity with like some bodily pleasures, with like sex for procreation rather than sex as procreation plus recreation? Well, so I think we would, uh, I would want to distinguish. Um, so you can, it's not, experiencing the pleasure is not bad. It's a part of the good that you're aiming at. But you don't want to aim at the pleasure as if it were the end. You want to aim at the good. So on this point, I think you could say in Catholic sexual teaching, um, I think you, you do actually find some, you know, like chastity or uh, apologists for humanae vitae um, making a claim like this. Uh, you know, you have a better sex life when sex is in a marriage that's open to life. Um, now, maybe that means, you know, there's pathologies that are creeping into the act when it's not done in that way that is going to come back to haunt you eventually. I mean, and I think that's actually true. So, like, the, the act is different when it's done in the right way. Um, and doing it in the right way means in a, in a commitment of the whole of life that is, you know, predicated on fidelity and permanence and is an act of love between two spouses who are giving themselves to each other. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think then I don't understand what Aquinas is saying in Article 6 when he says that um, like bodily pleasure is not proper accident of happiness. Sure. Let's maybe we could just take a quick look at that. And this is the second paragraph of Aquinas' answer. He says the beginning of the, that second paragraph: bodily pleasure cannot result from the perfect good, even as a proper accident of the perfect good. Why? He says bodily pleasure results from a good apprehended by sense which is a power of the soul, and which makes use of the body. And then he's, so basically what he's saying is, bodily pleasure results from sense experience. Senses are adapted to sensing bodily things, physical things. Our senses don't work on non-physical things. So we only are going to get the bodily pleasure from sensible things. And then the question is, are sensible things the highest good for us? And he's arguing, no, they're not the highest good. The highest good has to be a spiritual thing. So spiritual things may eventually overflow into the body. He does say that in question five, I think. Question four or question five, uh, he talks about this kind of overflow, like even at the resurrection. But he says, but it's not essential to the spiritual delight that you have a body that can feel it. So it's like, yeah, it, you do eventually get bodily pleasure, but bodily pleasure is not where you find the ultimate end because the body is not, I mean, the ultimate end is not a bodily thing. Have I answered your question? Great. Yeah. I've had a lot of questions the whole time, but I think I answered it by reading it very closely. And thanks for your lecture. So I'm not going to ask that, but I do want to mention Kafka quickly because um, that's who I've studied most of my life, and now I'm turning to Aquinas. But there's a lot more similarity than one might think. Um, Kant does not actually say that there wouldn't be a proper, effective good or your moral duty being pleasure or anything empirical. Um, there's nothing he would never deny that. 
the sorts of examples he gives of you know, being totally selfless and doing something very, very painful for the sake of your duty and nothing else, is not there to tell you that duty, when fully executed in your full life, wouldn't give you pleasure. He says that's a good thing, really. But instead to show that there has to be purity of motivation so that when those hard cases do come, like crucifixion, right, you have to go to it without looking for any sort of sensuous delight as your motivation for it. Um, and he actually does say that there is an intrinsic um, empirical effect from doing duty, so that there's an intrinsic feeling you might get from you doing your duty sort of paradoxically. So there is an effect which is proper to it, which, like Aquinas says, cannot be the motivation for it, right? but has to be the consequence natural from it. And that's respect. He says respect is actually a complex phenomenon of both feeling um, and also state of the will. So it's both sort of intellectual and sensuous in that sense. And respect is that natural consequence of doing your duty. Um, and then one final thing of, I think, a very interesting similarity is, you know, Aquinas is saying here that pleasure is the blossoming of the good, right? It's not the good as such. Um, and it therefore should not be the end itself, right? And I think there's a very good way of reconciling Kant there. And that, I mean, he's, he himself would say the same exact thing, that when you choose your duty, I mean, there's always going to be a matter. He never denies that. The matter of your duty might be actually like, you know, doing good things in a very sensuous, empirical way, right? But the reason you choose is because sort of this form of it being in conformity to the moral law, just like it might be in conformity to the form of the good, the Aquinas. Um, and it would never be for the delight or pleasure. So there's, a, I think, a fantastic amount of similarity. The one difference that has to be, I think, brought up and has to be explored is um, Kant's emphasis on the purity of your motivation, what he calls the ground of your choosing, right? And that might be totally unempirical, whereas for Aquinas it might be sort of empirical in part. Um, so that's, I think, the splitting point. But the splitting point is not in these things like, oh, kind of, you know, a hater of pleasure and sorts of things. It's a bit of a characterization. I'm not saying you said that, but that's a very common perception. You didn't say that at all. It talks about purity of motivation. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I think it's, it's good to have a, a, a conscientious Kantian in the room who can defend, you know, my mischaracter, my, my, my uh, caricature. It's the Cliff's Notes version, um, at, at best, maybe, the cartoon version. So that's, I, I accept that completely. Although I do think, that there are other significant differences between like the moral theory of Kant and the moral theory of Aquinas. So maybe pleasure isn't the place to uh, focus it, you know, so on pleasure, they might in fact be closer. But I think that there, I mean, for, for Kant, in the end, the, the sense of um, the happiness focus is not as robust uh, in in Kant, I think, as it is in Aquinas. So, um, you know, with Kant, it's about discovering the categorical imperative and, the, you know, like working through, it's a deontological theory, um, meaning like a theory of oughts, what you ought to do. Um, whereas for Aquinas, the, and this becomes a, you know, a debate in the modern period, um, well, Kant is already really a modern thinker. Um, what is the foundation for saying you ought to do something, and Aquinas ultimately is going to ground that in the quest for happiness. Maybe that's something that we could talk about more if people are interested um, in the next session, but I think we're going to have to leave this one where we're at. So uh, we'll pause and say our help is in the name of the Lord. Thanks for listening to this lecture on the Thomistic Institute podcast. The generosity of people like you makes this podcast possible. If you enjoy these talks, please consider showing your support at www.tomisticinstitute.org slash donate. Your donation of even a dollar helps us reach more college students and many others with the powerful truths of the faith, and it ensures that we can keep publishing top-notch lectures on this podcast. Thanks a lot.